So, we are continuing on in our series. This is our last verse in Psalm chapter 16 of our series, Pleasures Forevermore. And we're actually getting into that verse that talks about finding pleasure in God. And Micah Bailey has been kind enough to volunteer to read for us the psalm today. Yeah, good job, Micah. Julia, go on. Print is so small in these Bibles. <laughs> okay. Preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord, I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offering of blood I will not pour out, or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup, you hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places, indeed I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel, and the night also my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad, and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure, for you will not abandon my soul to shield, or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So we're in the climax of this psalm, chapter 16, talking about finding pleasure in God. In the first week, we talked about how, do you guys actually find pleasure in God? Or is reading His Word and studying Him and running to the foot of the cross, is that just like eating sandpaper for you? That's the goal of this series, is to help us find pleasure and enjoyment in God and who He is. And that is the verse we're looking at today. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life, in your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the first thing that I want us to notice about this psalm is that there is a path of life. And not everybody has found this path of life. I'm not only talking about the path to eternal life, which is through faith in the name of Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The path, the truth, and the life. I'm not only talking about eternal life, but I'm talking about experiencing joy and fullness of life in this life, here and now. This is the path of life that the psalm is talking about. It's talking about the path that we have to follow here and find joy here in this life and find joy in God forevermore in eternity. There's two types of joys that are being discussed here in this psalm. There is a path of life that must be walked by the Christian. It's not just a one-time flash-in-the-pan decision that you make at a summer camp and then fall off the path. If you do that and you're in that camp tonight, it just proves that you may have never been on the path to begin with. Psalm 16 verse 1 says, Preserve me, O God. I take refuge in you. If you're on the path, He will keep you on the path. He will not allow you to fall off the path if you are truly in Jesus Christ. There is a path of life. And not everybody is on this path. And that's what I think Jesus is getting at in Matthew chapter 7 when He says this. He says, Enter by the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the way, or the path, is easy. There's no resistance. It's the path of least resistance. One of my football coaches in high school used to say, never take the path of least resistance. Do the hard thing in life, even if it's difficult. Especially if it's difficult. Do the right thing. Because the way is easy, the path is easy, that leads to destruction, that leads to eternal damnation from God. The way is easy that leads to destruction. Those who enter by it are many. The majority of the world is going to hell in a handbasket. They have not discovered this path of life, this fullness of joy that can be found in God and in God alone. Do not be mistaken, friends. If you are in this room, you, will be, you are blessed to be in this room. If you are in Christ, you are eternally blessed to be in Christ because the majority of people are not. The way is easy, and those who enter by this gate, there are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way or the path is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. The minority of people, the remnant of people, will find this gate. Jesus also says in John chapter 10, he says, I am the gate. 
I'm the way to have true and only access to the Father. It's not through Buddha. It's not through Muhammad. It's not through Confucius. It's not through any other world religion that you can think of. He is the only path to fullness of life, both here and forevermore. And the second thing I want us to notice about this path is that only God can make that path known to you. Notice something about this passage here that David is getting at. He says, you make known to me the path of life. Without you, God, I'm clueless. Without your divine assistance, without you changing my heart and my life from the inside out, I hate this path. I run from this path. I want the path of least resistance that the rest of the world is going on and going to hell in a handbasket on, by the way. That's the path that I want. God makes known this path to us and God alone. That's also what I think Jesus is getting at here. In Matthew chapter... Apologies for that. Matthew 16, when he asks the disciples, point blank, he says, Who do you say that I am? What's my identity? Who am I to y'all as my disciples? Am I just another good teacher? Am I just a miracle worker? Am I a liar? Am I a lunatic? Or am I your Lord? He says, what about you, Jesus asked. Who do you say that I am? To his disciples that are listening to him here during the social exchange. And Simon Peter, who's usually the spokesman for the group, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. In other words, Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You are all I have in this life. There's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Joy can be found in you and in you alone, both here and later in the life to come. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. And notice what Jesus says in response to Peter's confession here. Jesus replied to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but my Father who is in heaven. Only God can change the human heart. Only God can grant somebody repentance and remove them from the kingdom of darkness and place them in the kingdom of light. That is entirely a work of God. And God gets all the credit for our salvation. That's what Jesus is saying here to Peter upon his confession. Just in case Peter might want to get prideful and say, I earned my salvation. I made my confession of faith, and I did all of that. Peter said, Jesus says, no, 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 no. You can't confess my name and believe in my name and love my name without my Father doing this work profoundly in you. Now, what else can God do? What is the only thing that God can do in Psalm chapter 16? What is also a work of the Lord that David is talking about here? And the answer is this, according to Psalm chapter 16. Only God can give you pleasure in Him. Only God can transform your heart from hating church to loving church. From hating your Bible to loving reading your Bible. I remember when I first became a Christian, I hated reading my Bible, initially, for most of my life. But when I became a Christian, I remember opening my Bible for the first time, it seemed. And the words seemed to be in 3D. I couldn't get enough of it. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Oftentimes we think of God as this celestial being who hates fun. He hates the pleasure that we experience in this life. And that is a totally unbiblical view of God. God wants us to take pleasure in who He is. And I remember praying earnestly when I moved to Odessa, Texas a couple years ago. I prayed, God, I want to find pleasure in you like King David does in this psalm. And I remember after praying that prayer one time, I remember walking back to the copying room that I had at the church that I was working at at the time. And I used to print off whole passages of Scripture on this printer. I'd print off the entire book of 2 Corinthians, for example. I remember one night printing off 2 Corinthians in its entirety, like 13 pages, and I took it out of the printer, and I stapled it together, and it was still warm. And it smelled like a new paper smell, fresh out of the printer. And I remember looking at God's Word as almost it was for the first time in my life. And I remember drooling over the text of Scripture. It might sound funny to you, and to be honest, it was funny to me. It is only a work of God that He can do that. 
How can you change a sinner's heart into somebody who drools over God's holy word? That is not a work of man. That is a work of God. I'm not saying I'm like that all the time. Very few times, actually, when I drool over God's word to that extreme. But God is the one who helps you rejoice in Him. Do you take that kind of pleasure in Him? Or even simple things like going to youth group or going to church. You look forward to hanging out with the saints in the land, as He said earlier on in this psalm. Do you take pleasure in that God? Because there are two things I want us to notice about this type of pleasure that we have in God, that David notes for us. He says this. He says, In your presence there is fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Did you catch that? There's an infinitely high amount of pleasure that God will help you take in Him. It's full to the brim. It's overflowing. It's not just a glass a third of the way full. This is fullness of joy. And this glass is infinitely high. And it overflows with your joy. And so much so that you want to have others experience that same kind of joy that you experience. It's full. And it's also infinitely wide. It lasts forever and ever and ever and ever. This is the best joy that you could ever experience. And God wants to give you that joy. This is the only kind of joy that can satisfy you fully and forevermore. It's by finding it in God and in God alone. But so many times, dear friends, we find pleasure in what the Bible calls the fleeting pleasures of sin. This glass looks kind of disgusting, if you ask me. Kind of looks like Gabe's uh, apple cider in the fridge at home. <laughs> it's like a third of the way full. It looks kind of murky. This cup ain't very big. And this cup certainly ain't very wide. But this is what we do when we settle for the fleeting pleasures of sin. Now make no mistake, dear friends. There is pleasure in sin. We would not commit it if we did not experience even just a little bit of the pleasure that comes from sin. But it does not last. It's fleeting. It's like a bird that just flies away and you never see it ever again. It's gone. As we talked about previously, it's like cotton candy that promises something so good and so fulfilling and it leaves you sick at the end of the day. This is what we settle for oftentimes when we settle for things such as sexual immorality, or worshiping sports, worshiping our reputation, whatever it is, it's fleeting. It'll be here today, gone tomorrow. It's a mist. It's a vapor. And God wants to give us so much more than this. He wants to give us something like this. He wants to give us drink from His river of delight. Not even a river, not even a sea, not even an ocean of delights can contain all that God has for us when we seek Him and the pleasures that He offers us. This is what God wants to offer us. If we would only draw near to Him and seek after Him. And C.S. Lewis says this about how we settle for lesser fleeting pleasures of sin when God has so much more for us. He says, Our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. Slide one, slide two. I feel like I'm at the eye doctor. <laughs> Our desires are not too strong, but they are too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite pleasure is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. We settle far too easily. People who seek these things like premarital sex and getting drunk and all these other things, they're not seeking a high enough pleasure. They're settling. Don't settle. Don't settle in the Christian life. Because God has so much more for us. If we will just seek Him and His kingdom, He will give us that pleasure that He promises us. So, how do you get this pleasure? So I want it. I want pleasure in God. I want to drool over His Word if necessary. I want this kind of pleasure. Do you? Because Psalm chapter 16 gives us an answer on how we get and experience this pleasure that God offers us. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. If you know a little bit about the Bible, 
Who is the person that sits at God's right hand in heaven? Jesus is. But Jesus is the one who sits at God's right hand in heaven. This is two different ways of saying the same thing. Being in God's presence and being at God's right hand, it's two different ways of saying the same thing. Talking about drawing near to God. Being in God's tangible presence. Now this makes me ask a question. How do we experience the, pleasure, the presence of God? Because oftentimes in our churches, we talk about how, Lord, your presence, Lord. We just want to be in it. We want to seek it. But oftentimes we don't even know what it is. There's a sense in which we're always in God's presence, right? God is everywhere present right now. He's in Menominee, He's in Cambodia, He's in Nigeria, He's in Alaska. He's at Menominee Lines Church. He's at Cedarbrook Church right now. God is everywhere present. But how do we experience the blessed presence of the Lord? How do we draw near to Him in faith? Because God is everywhere at once. The psalmist even tells us, if I make my bed in the heavens, you are there. And if I make my bed in the depths of Sheol, you are there as well. And this is something that we don't like talking about in church. Beloved, but not only is God present fully in heaven right now, but He's also present in hell. Revelation, Revelation chapter 14 makes this very clear. Talking about those who do not put their faith in Jesus Christ. It says that they will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. That Lamb is none other than Jesus Christ Himself. They are not experiencing the blessed presence of God in hell. They're experiencing the cursed presence of God in hell. If you're a Christian, you will experience the blessed, comfortable presence of God in glory. But if you are not a Christian, you will be punished forevermore by God and His right judgment on you. Which presence do you want to experience? For some people, it's heaven, God's presence is. And for some people, it's a living hell. Which presence do you want to experience? So my question is, how do you experience the blessed presence of God? Do you see that distinction? I want to be in the blessed presence of God. And this is how you draw near to God. You draw near to His Son, Jesus. It's very simple. That's how you experience the blessed presence of God. Let me give an illustration here. I've been going over to my dad's house an exorbitant amount. I've hardly been home with my roommates. Because I love hanging out with my dad, who lives about two minutes from my apartment, which I live with with my buddies at the Hype House. <laughs> my dad and I are frequently in the same house together when we hang out. But sometimes, I'm in the basement, and he's upstairs. Sometimes he's in the basement, and I'm upstairs. In both scenarios, I'm technically in His presence. But when I want to really be in the presence of my dad, I will go and I will sit with him at the dinner table, at the couch. I will draw near to the intimate presence of my father to hang out with him. And some of us, we genuinely know Christ but we are not near Him. There's a difference. Some of you are anxious and depressed and lonely because you are at the other end of the house. How you solve that problem is by drawing near to Jesus Christ in faith and in love. Not just doing it to check the box. Not doing it because you have to, but doing it because you want to. That's how you experience the blessed presence of God. The New Testament and the Old Testament don't both confirm this reality. James chapter 4, verse 8, James says this. Draw near to God, He'll draw near to you. There's a question in the small group manual this week. If you don't feel close to God, who moved? Was it you? Or was it God? Something to think about before you go to small group. But the Old Testament also confirms this reality in Hosea 6, verse 3. It says this, Let us press on to know Him, 
to know God, to be near to His presence. Let's press on to God. This is not a casual seeking after the kingdom. This is with violence almost. I want to seek after God so hard that I sweat while doing it. Let us press on to know Him. As surely as the sun rises, He will appear. He will come to us like the winter snow, like the spring rains that water the earth. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm counting, I'm counting on snow being in Wisconsin come winter. It's already happened. I don't know when winter is anymore. I think it's like July now. <laughs> but you're counting on the winter snow come January. You're counting on the sun to rise tomorrow morning. Just as you can count on the snow to come to Menominee, Wisconsin in January, and as you can count on the sun rising tomorrow if the Lord tarries and does not return before then, you can count on God showing up for people who seek after Him. He will draw near to you if you draw near to Him in faith. Finally, I'd like to clo close with a quote from Jonathan Edwards. Arguably the greatest theological mind that this country has ever produced in the 18th century. He says this about finding pleasure and finding enjoyment in God. The enjoyment of Jesus is the only happiness with which our souls can be fully satisfied. Fully satisfied. Fullness of joy. Not the partial, fleeting joy that many of us have been settling for. To go to heaven fully to enjoy Jesus is infinitely better than the most pleasant experience you can have on this earth. Notice something here, y'all. The reason you want to go to heaven is because you want to enjoy the presence, the blessed presence of Jesus. Heaven is not just a place, it's a person. If you just want to go to heaven to live forever and not experience hell, you're wrong. The reason you should want to go to heaven is because you want to be with Jesus. Those who want to just escape the flames of hell, and that's it, they won't be in heaven. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That's why you want to go to heaven. Fully to enjoy Jesus. It's infinitely better than the most pleasant experience you can have on this earth. Think of the most pleasant experience you've ever had on this earth. And wait on the scales of being with Jesus forever. There's no comparison. These are but shadows, but Jesus is the substance. These are but beams of sunlight, but Jesus is the sun. And finally, these are but streams. But Jesus is the ocean. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's Psalm 16. It's pretty good. Father in heaven, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for David, for him writing this psalm, and for your Holy Spirit inspiring it. God, may we live it out. May we not settle for less, lesser pleasures. That will leave us empty at the end of the day. But may we seek after the ultimate source of our pleasure. For maximum satisfaction. Forevermore satisfaction. May we seek after the God of those pleasures. Even now in our small groups, God, may we bless our conversations that we draw near to you. We praise you for this group. We praise you for adding to our number of those who are being saved. For in you and through you and for you are all things. And it's in your son's precious name that we pray. Amen. Amen.